Hey everybody, if this is your first time watching, my name is Nathan. I have the honor of serving as the lead pastor at City Lions Church. And we started a new series last week going through the book of Lamentations called Lament. Say Lament with me. Laments are prayers of complaint to God. And last week we talked about how it, if we don't lament the difficult, painful, frustrating things in life, all that anger, depression, and anxiety, we can actually repress it. And it'll burst to the surface and cause hurt and harm in other areas of our lives, like our marriage, our work relationships, our careers, or even our parenting, which is why God has given us this ability to lament. And last week we learned that Lamentations is a book that is written to reflect on one of the most devastating events in the history of God's people, and that's the destruction of Jerusalem. God allowed the Babylonian Empire to come in and crush Jerusalem and her people, and then they took their best and brightest back to Babylon to brainwash them and have them become Babylonians, essentially destroying not just their homes, their temple, and their land, but their very culture as well. In response, the prophet Jeremiah, and by the way, a prophet's a person who hears from God and then shares that word with the world, what he receives, he composes five poems that become the Book of Lamentations. These poems express deep, honest pain, frustration, agony, and anger towards God. Jeremiah is not afraid to let God know how he's feeling. Look what he wrote in the last chapter. He wrote this in chapter one. Oh Lord, look, she mourns, and see how I am despised. Does it mean nothing to you? All you who pass by, look around and see if there's any suffering like mine, which the Lord brought on me when he erupted in fierce anger. You know, Lamentations confronts the reality of pain. What do we do when life isn't fair? When everything around us is falling apart, when we can't make sense of the brokenness all around, what do we do? We lament. We lament because lament is the bridge between pain and praise. Lament always starts out by express, expressing incredible pain and sorrow and struggle and confusion, but then incredibly, it, it ends with praise, with worship, with a greater trust in God. But it's a journey to get there, and it's not linear. There's ups and there's downs, but if we lean into the pain, the sorrow and the anger, if we learn to lament, our faith grows deeper, our trust in God becomes fuller, and you build a resilient faith that's able to look to God when everything else around us is falling apart. Because the world we live in is full of pain, anguish and suffering. It could be the pain of losing a loved one. You know, this week I was talking to a buddy of mine that had just lost a parent. It was sudden. And even though a few months have passed by and everyone else has moved on, he, he still feels the pain. The loss is still with him and he deals with it by just being busy. Because if he slows down, it just feels too raw. It could be the pain of betrayal of a friend or a spouse. You know, I was listening to a podcast that was started by these three good friends, but over time, one of them had significant mental health issues. And rather than having his friends understand, maybe help him get healthy, they actually forced him off the podcast, making him extremely, you know, experience this tremendous betrayal, this anger, and this sorrow that, that his friends would abandon him. To him, it was once unthinkable. Or how about you just watch the news? You see this global dimension of it, right? You see stories of more gun violence, more racial tension in the world, prices for food and gas, and everything else keeps going up and up and up and wages keep going down and down and down. And what most of us do is we post an article on Facebook, we complain to our friends and family about it, but then it just makes us feel angrier. What do we do? What do we do when we look around and the world around us is broken or just out of order? The response, we lament. And so let's go ahead and look at chapter 2 of Lamentations. Jeremiah goes to the next level of lament. So go ahead, if you have a Bible, you can open up to Lamentations 2, or you can follow along with me here on this video. The theme of chapter 1 is pain expressed in sorrow. Chapter 2 is pain expressed in anger. It says this, The Lord in his anger has cast a dark shadow over beautiful Jerusalem. The fairest of Israel's cities lies in the dust thrown down from the heights of heaven. In his day of great anger, the Lord has shown no mercy, even to his temple. Now, last week, you may recall that Jeremiah blamed Jerusalem for her sin that led her to her demise. In this chapter, it looks like he changes his mind. It seems like he blames God. He writes, all the strength of Israel vanishes beneath his fierce anger. The Lord has withdrawn his protection as the enemy attacks. He consumes the whole land of Israel like a raging fire. Jeremiah is describing the military strength of Israel melting against the ravages of the Babylonian hordes. The level of their military defenses have been destroyed. They destroy houses and kill anyone they encounter. What Jeremiah finds even more shocking is that they utterly destroy the temple. He writes, He has broken down his temple as though it were merely a garden shelter. 
the Lord has blotted out all memory of the holy festivals and Sabbath days. <laughs> Why did God shut down church? Now, it's important to remember that God had called Israel to represent him to the nations. They were in a covenant where they would worship God and God alone and then take care of the one and another. That, that was the idea of covenant. You honor God, you honor one another. Instead, they chased after whatever God was trendy and would get them what they wanted. Then they oppressed the poor and the marginalized. They thought since they were God's chosen people that they were privileged and they could do whatever they wanted until God sent Babylon to humble them and bring them down to their knees. And now Jeremiah is watching this happen and he is traumatized and says, I've cried until the tears no longer come. My heart is broken. My spirit's poured out in agony as I see the desperate plight of my people. Little children and tiny babies are fainting and dying in the streets. Jeremiah, he's expressing his heartbreak about what has happened to the city. He saw children and babies suffering during the siege, and he can't stand the idea that God in his anger would have allowed this, or even directed this. He continues his lament, what can I say about you? Who has ever seen such sorrow? O daughter of Jerusalem, to what can I compare your anguish? O virgin daughter of Zion, how can I comfort you? For your wound is as deep as the sea. Can I, can I pause for a moment? Can I ask this? Does this describe any of you watching this? Maybe you're watching this video and you're carrying sorrow and anguish with you. And maybe you're looking for comfort, for hope, for healing. Maybe you're carrying the anguish of a marriage that's fallen apart or the anguish of a pregnancy that didn't go to term. The anguish of unanswered prayer and the wound is deeper, deeper than the ocean. And so like Jeremiah, you're asking the question, who can heal you? You know, when we're in pain, we look for someone to help us, to heal us, but we also look for someone to blame. Jeremiah didn't just blame Jerusalem or God. He actually blamed his fellow prophets. He writes, your prophets have said so many foolish things, false to the core. They did not save you from exile by pointing out your sins. Instead, they painted false pictures, filling with false hope. Man, this verse, it hit me like a two by four when I read it. You know, we live in a world where we can find justification for almost anything we do. If, if you have in a position or an, an opinion, you can go online and find someone who will back it up to the point where we've diminished the power of sin in our lives. But here's the thing, if left unchecked, sin, if not dealt with, will deal with you. You can either kill your sin or sin will kill you. And this lament shows us what happens when Israel did not kill their sin. It says, the Lord who did just as he planned, he has fulfilled the promises of disaster he made long ago. Wait a minute, pause here for a second. What plan? What is Jeremiah talking about? You see, when God chose Israel to represent him to the world so that people would know what God was like, he gave this list back in the book of Deuteronomy. He gave a list that said, if you followed my ways, you would experience a blessing and you would be blessed to be a blessing to the entire world. That blessing would carry on to generations. But if you departed from God's ways and committed injustice and evil, then you'd experience curses. And Israel agreed to this. But for 500 years, Israel did not live up to their end of this covenant. They continually disobeyed God, they committed grave and awful injustice and depravity. And so God, being patient, withheld his judgment for about 500 years until now. Now the plan that Israel had agreed to, God was following through on his decree. And even though this was something that Jeremiah had warned the people for 40 years was coming, when it finally came about, he was devastated. He was broken up by it. So he laments to God in anger, in frustration, in confusion. And then he encourages the city to do the same. He says to Jerusalem, Cry aloud before the Lord, O walls of beautiful Jerusalem. Let your tears flow like a river day and night. Give yourselves no rest. Give your eyes no relief. You see, Jerusalem is personified as a woman. In fact, scholars believe that she's personified as a woman who's been assaulted. And so Jer Jeremiah is encouraging her to find her voice, to speak out in the midst of oppression. He writes, rise during the night and cry out. Pour out your heart like water to the Lord. Lift up your hands to him in prayer, pleading for your children. For in every street they are faint with hunger. And finally, she speaks. After Jeremiah comes around her and encourages her, she cries out to God and says, O oh Lord, think about this. 
Should you treat your own people this way? Should mothers eat their own children? Those they once bounced on their knees? <laughs> Whoa. Like, let's pause for a second. That is some graphic, disturbing imagery. Like, this is something right out of Saving Private Ryan or something like that. The Babylonians spent two years surrounding the city of Jerusalem so that nothing could get in or get out. The people were literally starved to the point that they had to resort to cannibalism. Guys, that's the ugliness of our broken, sin-soaked world. It's painful. And the Bible doesn't sugarcoat it. Can I ask a question? What do we do with this? This poetry, the imagery, it's raw, it's angry, it's brutal. Jeremiah's account, it's not whitewashed. It's honest and it's open. It's in your face. What do we do when we are confronted with so much evil around us? You, you see, there's two lenses I think we need, two theological lenses we need to have in order to understand what's happening. The first is this, is we can't have a God of love without a God of justice. Now, there are two extremes that I found that people kind of fall into the spectrum here. On the one hand, there are the people that have a high view of the love of God. We love that God is patient. He's long-suffering. He's filled with compassion and grace and mercy. And to be honest, that is true. That's why we worship God. That's why we, 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 we proclaim His name, because God who loves us, He showers us with compassion. But I think these folks also struggle with the idea that there's a God of justice, which means he's going to judge sin and evil. The other extreme is that there are Christians I know, and maybe you've met them, they almost delight in the idea that God is going to bring judgment. They're like, <laughs> they get giddy talking about destruction and talking about God bringing, you know, raining down, you know, hellfire and all that stuff. Uh, here's the thing. We need to hold the love of God, the mercy of God, the compassion of God, in tension with the, the justice and the mercy and, and, and the judgment of God. Because while most of us who are watching this, I'm assuming you're probably a middle-class American, we struggle with this idea of a God of justice. Most Christians who live in the two-thirds world, they don't. Christians who live in Africa and Asia and Latin America who've experienced oppression, who've experienced persecution and injustice, they're crying out for God's justice to be enacted in this life. Or the next. So for them, the idea of a God that judges sin, that will destroy, destroy evil, that's something that's welcome. Some, a God that's going to hold their oppressors accountable, they want that. Now for those of you who are about to get excited, like, that's right, God's bringing judgment, it's coming, don't get too giddy because God's judgment comes first to the church. The justice of God comes to the people of God first and foremost. That's why God allowed Jerusalem to fall. They lacked compassion. They were, they were perpetuating all sorts of injustice and evil. So what did God do? He brought judgment to his people before Babylon. We've got to hold that in tension because Jesus holds it in tension because justice and mercy meet at the cross. Jeremiah, he's the poet prophet. He's writing hundreds of years before Jesus, yet in many ways he is anticipating the coming of Messiah. Remember what verse 13 said? It says, Jeremiah asked these questions, and at the time, they couldn't be answered. But when we look back at the Old Testament through the cross, we find answers. Who has ever seen such sorrow? Jesus on the cross has seen that sorrow. What can I compare your anguish to? Well, Jesus on the cross experienced the anguish of crucifixion and separation from God. How can I comfort you? For your wounds are as deep as the sea. Can I just tell you right now that if you're watching this and you're in incredible pain and you don't understand what is going on, you're struggling with this, only Jesus can understand your pain. Only Jesus can understand the level of maybe guilt from your past that you've experienced. And maybe you're asking that question that Jeremiah asked, who can heal you? Jesus can heal your deepest wounds and bring comfort to your deepest grief and turmoil. Jesus is the one who on the cross, he laments. He lamented. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One of Jesus' names in scripture is a man of sorrow. He is acquainted with pain and anger and confusion and doubt and grief and sin. Because on the cross, Jesus took on himself the sin of the world. He took on your sin and my sin. And if you wonder, what does the mercy of God look like? Look to the cross. If you want to know what does the justice of God look like? Look to the cross. Because on the cross, Jesus forgives you of your sin completely, and he sees you as holy and blameless. It's the cross where we find ultimate hope in healing and redemption. So these two theological truths this passage teach us, it shows us that, you know, God, he's not neutral towards evil, he hates it. 
but we can't have a God of love without a God of just judgment, and he will execute justice. But we also know that justice and mercy, they meet at the cross. But then what do we do with that? Now what? How do we live in light of this? You know, last week I talked about how we have three groups of people who are watching this video. Some of you are experiencing suffering and loss right now. And so last week we talked about how do you lament in the midst of that. Another group of you has just come out of a time of pain and loss. But that first group is the group of those of you who maybe you've never experienced pain and loss. And so today I want to talk with you about how do you practically help people going through pain and loss? How, how do you help people that are experiencing deep, deep pain? And I want to get really, really practical here because I think many of us don't know what to do when someone in our life is hurting, when they're in pain and loss and their world falls apart. But this passage actually gives us some real practical teachings, some real practical tools in how to do that. We talked about how in Lamentations there's two characters. The one is the narrator, which is Jeremiah, and the other is the grieving woman who represents Jerusalem. And their interaction actually shows us how we can help people in our lives who are experiencing great pain and loss. So if you're taking notes, number one is to this, enter into their pain. Keep in mind that Jeremiah spent 40 years reminding Jerusalem that they, if they continue to sin and rebel and commit acts of injustice, then God's judgment was coming. And they mocked Jeremiah, they ridiculed him, they attacked him, and yet Look how he responds in, plight of Jerusalem, in Jerusalem's plight. He says, I have cried until the tears no longer come. My heart is broken. My spirit is poured out in agony. As I see the desperate plight of my people, little children and tiny babies are fainting and dying in the streets. Now notice what Jeremiah didn't say. He didn't say, told you so. You should have listened to me. Now you are getting what you deserve. Instead, Jeremiah shows empathy. Now, if you Google empathy, empathy actually means the ability to understand and share in the feelings of others. Empathy is when someone shares their depression, their anxiety, and their loss, and we can say, me too. You know, Brene Brown, she's uh, one of my favorite authors. She writes a lot about empathy, and she makes a distinction between sympathy and empathy. When someone says, I had a miscarriage, sympathy says, well, at least you can get pregnant. When someone says, I don't know if my marriage is going to make it. Sympathy says, well, at least you have a marriage. When someone says, you know, Billy is struggling in school, sympathy says, well, at least, you know, little Johnny has straight A's. You know what empathy says to all of those responses and all those situations? Empathy says this, I am so, so sorry. I, I, I don't know what to say, but I'm glad you told me. Jeremiah in the moment of pain, enters into the pain of the city, the pain of the people, and he laments on their behalf. What he also teaches us is that if we want to help hurting people in our lives, we need to show up and shut up. <laughs> Go ahead and say show up and shut up right now. You see, so often there are people in our lives we can get intimidated by not knowing what to say when they have deep, deep hurt. Maybe we don't even know what to respond. So sometimes we may not know what to say, so we just don't respond at all. But look what Jeremiah describes the leadership of Jerusalem doing in the midst of their turmoil. It says in verse 10, The leaders of beautiful Jerusalem sit on the ground in silence. They're clothed in burlap and throw dust on their heads. Sometimes when someone is hurting, we may say to them, Hey, you know, let me know what you need. Here's a better response the next time you know someone is hurting. Just show up. Just show up and bring a meal. Don't ask. Just show up. Just show up to their house and say, hey, can, can I watch your kids? Hey, can I clean your house? Hey, can I help with laundry? Just show up and be with them. You see, when someone's world is falling apart, they don't need your answers. They just need your presence. And finally, the third way you can help hurting people that we see in this passage is allow them to vent their pain. See, Jeremiah encourages the city of Jerusalem to bear her soul to God. He says, rise up during the night and cry out, lift up your hands to him in prayer. See, the worst thing we could do is when people lament, when they start to give vent to their pain and anguish and cry, they're confused, is, is to shut them down, to try to answer their questions, to try to offer up some sort of theological or philosophical answer to pain and suffering before we allow people to vent, that is. Because sometimes before people have questions, they just want to vent their pain and their anguish. You see, then you need to let them do that. Let them vent their sorrow and their struggles, especially words of anger. But we have a hard time with that, don't we? But remember that God can handle it. He can handle your friend's anger. 
your friend's frustration, your friend's doubt and confusion better than you can. You know, Jeremiah could have answered the people and said, you are getting the results of generations of sin, rebellion, and evil deeds. He could have said, listen guys, I'm going to tell you the theological, philosophical underpinnings of what you're going through. Instead, now he says, Jerusalem, I want to let you have a voice. Speak out. And she doesn't hold back. She writes those graphic words, Oh Lord, think about this. Should you treat your own people this way? Should mothers eat their own children, those they once bounced on their knees? Now again, these words are graphic. They're angry. They're full of hurt and confusion. This is a lament. This is prayer. This is worship. You know, most of us think of worship and prayer as, hey, I'm happy and I'm telling you how great things are. But true worship is when we can give God not just the good things we feel, but we can express the not so good things, the pain, the confusion, the misery, and the doubts. And as we do that, in the midst, we find comfort, we find hope, we find healing. That if Jesus is the man of sorrows who can lament from the cross, we too can lament and pour out our pain, our anguish and our confusion to the Father. Maybe you're watching this right now and you are just filled with that pain and that anguish. Maybe you're feeling stuff that's being triggered or re-triggered. If that's you today, I want you to do something. I know I can't see you because you're watching on the other side of the screen, but why don't you just go ahead and open your hands up like this. Maybe you're doubting your faith right now. Maybe you're feeling just a lot of anger. Maybe it's towards God. Maybe it's towards people in your life. Whatever it is, just hold up your pain, your hands right now as a symbol of saying, God, I'm going to bring my pain to you. So wherever you're watching this, just hold up your hands like this. Just like Jeremiah encouraged Jerusalem to. Hold up your hands and let me pray over you. Father, I just right now want to pray for my brothers and sisters right now who are holding up their hands because they're holding up a burden. Maybe it's unanswered prayer. Maybe it's confusion. Maybe it's doubt. Maybe they're looking around at the church and wondering why aren't Christians acting more like Christ. I don't know what it is, God. But we want to surrender our anguish to you, our hurt, our pain. We surrender it to you, God, because who else can we give this to? People can't handle this, but you can. So, Father, we, we ask that you would take this, our, our hurt, our anguish, our pain, we surrender it to you. And God, would you use it to make us more like you? Would you use it also so that we can help others who will come after us, who will also experience pain, suffering, hurt, disappointment, and loss? Thank you, God, that you do not waste our pain. Thank you that there is purpose in our suffering. We look to you to show us what that is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's message. I hope it spoke to you and it inspired you. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button. That way you can stay up to date in all of our latest messages here at City Alliance Church. And if you want to partner with us to take the gospel here, there, and everywhere, go ahead and hit the give button. Your faithful tithes and offerings help us reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ.